Lesson 2 for January 2 to 8, ready for teaching on January 9, Crisis of Leadership, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 2. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you as we open your word almost at the middle at the book of Isaiah. We thank you that this book was written because it tells us about Jesus coming, what Jesus is going to do, and also how we can be involved in that. But today we're studying about the leadership crisis that Judah had. And as we do so, as we open this book of Isaiah, may we find indications there for us in the way that we relate to one another, to our church and to our community. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Let's read that again, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. When asked by one of his disciples about the ingredients of good government, Confucius answered, sufficient food, sufficient weapons, and the confidence of the common people. But, asked the disciple, suppose you had no choice but to dispense with one of those three, which would you forego? Weapons, said Confucius. His disciple persisted, suppose you were then forced to dispense with one of the two that are left, which would you forego? Replied Confucius, Food, for from of old hunger has been the lot of all men, but a people that no longer trusts its rulers is lost indeed. And that's edited by Michael P. Green in 1,500 Illustrations for Biblical Preaching, published in Grand Rapids by Baker Books in 1989, page 215. People do indeed want strong, trustworthy leadership. When a soldier was signing up for a second term of duty, the army recruiter asked why he wanted to re-enlist. I tried civilian life, he said, but nobody is in charge out there. This week, we will look at Judah's crisis of leadership and the sad results that followed. Sunday, January 3. The king is dead. Long live the king. Isaiah 6.1 talks about the death of King Isaiah. Read Second Chronicles chapter 26 and then answer this question. What is the significance of King Isaiah's death? Firstly, we'll read Isaiah 6 verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 26, beginning at verse 1. Now all the people of Judah took Isaiah, who was sixteen years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah, after the king rested with his fathers. Isaiah was sixteen years old when he became king, and he reigned fifty-two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now he went out and made war against the Philistines, and broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabna, and the wall of Ashdod, and he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived in Gerbal, and against the Meonites. Also the Ammonites brought tribute to Isaiah. His fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. 
And Isaiah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the corner buttress of the wall. Then he fortified them. Also he built towers in the desert. He dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowland and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. Moreover, Isaiah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies, according to the number of their role as prepared by Jeel, the scribe, and Messiah, the officer, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The total number of chief officers of the mighty men of valour was 2,600, and under their authority was an army of 307,000 five hundred that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. Then Isaiah prepared for them, for the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armour, bows, and slings to cast stones. And he made devices in Jerusalem invented by skilful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide for he was marvellously helped till he became strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Isaiah and said to him, is it not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the son of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense? Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honour from the Lord God. Then Isaiah became furious. He had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord, beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priests, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of the place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out, because the Lord had struck him. King Isaiah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the Acts of Isaiah, from first to last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote, So Isaiah rested with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of burial which belonged to the kings. For they said, He is a leper. Then Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. Different perspectives can be given regarding the death of this king. 1. Although Isaiah's reign was long and prosperous, when he had become strong he grew proud to his destruction, as it says in Second Chronicles 26.16, and attempted to offer incense to the people. When the priest rightly stopped him because he was not authorised as a priestly descendant of Aaron, as we read in verse 18, the king became angry. At this point, when the king refused reproof, the Lord immediately struck him with leprosy, which he had to the day of his death, and being leprous lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of the Lord. How ironic that Isaiah saw a vision of the pure, immortal, divine king in his house temple in the very year the impure human king died. 2. There is a striking contrast between Isaiah and Isaiah. Isaiah reached for holiness presumptuously for the wrong reason, pride, and instead became ritually impure, so that he was cut off from holiness. Isaiah, on the other hand, allowed God's holiness to reach him. He humbly admitted his weakness and yearned for moral purity which he received, as we read in Isaiah 6, 5-7. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Like the tax collector in Jesus' parable, he went away justified as it says in Luke 18.14, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. 3. There is a striking similarity between Uzziah's leprous body and the moral condition of his people. Verse 6 of chapter 1 reads, There is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and bleeding wounds. And 4. The death of Uzziah in about 740 BC marks a major crisis in the leadership of God's people. The death of any absolute ruler makes his or her country vulnerable during a transition of power. But Judah was in special danger because tiglath pileser III had ascended the throne of Assyria a few years before in 745 BC and immediately went on the warpath which made his nation an invincible superpower that threatened the independent existence of all nations in the Near East. In this time of crisis, God encouraged Isaiah by showing the prophet that he was still in control. So to finish the day, read carefully Second Chronicles 26.16. In what ways do each one of us potentially face the same thing? How can dwelling on the cross protect us from this pitfall? Second Chronicles 26, 16 But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Monday, January 4. Holy, holy, holy. Our text for today is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Notice what was happening here in the first four verses of Isaiah 6. The king dies during great political turmoil. The Assyrians are on the warpath. For Isaiah, it could have been a fearful time when he was not sure who was in control. And then what happens? While taken in vision, Isaiah gazed upon the blazing glory of God upon his throne, heard the antiphony of shining seraphim, or burning ones, calling out the words, Holy, holy, holy felt the resultant seismic shaking of the floor beneath him and peered through swirling smoke as it filled the temple. It must have been a stunning experience for the prophet. For sure, Isaiah now knew who was in control, despite outward events. Question. Where is the Lord in this vision? Verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Why would the Lord make an appearance to Isaiah here as opposed to anywhere else? Let's have a look at Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And Exodus 40 verses 34 to 38, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. 
and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. So the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Ezekiel, Daniel and John were in exile when they received their visions in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 7, 9 and 10, and Revelation 4 and 5. Just in case there was a misprint, I'm going to read Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Like Isaiah, they needed special comfort and encouragement that God was still in charge, even though their world was falling apart. Daniel and Ezekiel were captives in a pagan nation that had destroyed their own, and John had been exiled to a lonely island by a hostile political power. No doubt, these visions helped give them what they needed to stay faithful, even during a crisis situation. Ellen G. White, writing in Prophets and Kings, page 307, says, As Isaiah beheld this revelation of the glory and majesty of his Lord, he was overwhelmed with a sense of the purity and holiness of God. How sharp the contrast between the matchless perfection of his Creator and the sinful course of those who, with himself, had long been numbered among the chosen people of Israel and Judah. End of quote. The transcendent holiness of God, emphasised in Isaiah's vision, is a basic aspect of his message. God is a holy God, and he demands holiness from his people, a holiness he will give to them if only they will repent, turn from their evil ways, and submit to him in faith and obedience. And so to finish today, all of us have been in discouraging situations, where from outward appearance all seemed lost. And even if you didn't get a vision of the glory of the Lord, as did Isaiah here, recount the ways in which the Lord was able to sustain you and your faith during these crises. What have you learned from these experiences that you could share with others? Tuesday, January 5. New Personality. Our text for today is Isaiah 6, verses 5 to 7. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. At the sanctuary or temple, only the high priest could approach the presence of God in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, and only with a protective smoke screen of incense, or he would die, as we read in Leviticus 16, verse 2. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. And verses 12 and 13. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense, 
beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. Isaiah saw the Lord even though he was not the high priest, and he was not burning incense. The temple filled with smoke, as we read in verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 6, reminding us of the cloud in which God's glory appeared on the Day of Atonement, as we read in Leviticus 16 verse 2. Awestruck and thinking he was finished, Isaiah cried out with an acknowledgement of his sin and the sin of his people, reminiscent of the high priest's confession on the Day of Atonement. Let's compare Exodus chapter 33 and verse 20. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And Judges chapter 6 verses 22 and 23. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you, do not fear, you shall not die. And Isaiah 6 verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And Leviticus 16 and verse 21, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. In the book Prophets and Kings, page 308, we read, Standing, as it were, in the full light of the divine presence within the inner sanctuary, he realised that, if left to his own imperfection and inefficiency, he would be utterly unable to accomplish the mission to which he had been called. End of quote. Question, why did the seraph use a live or burning coal from the altar to cleanse Isaiah's lips? Isaiah 6 Verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hands a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. The seraph explained that through touching the prophet's lips, his guilt and sin were removed in verse 7. The sin is not specified, but it need not be limited to wrong speech, because lips signify not only speech, but also the entire person who utters it. Having received moral purification, Isaiah was now able to offer pure praise to God. Fire is an agent of purification because it burns away impurity, as we read in Numbers 31 verse 23. Everything that can endure fire you shall put through the fire, and it shall be clean, and it shall be purified with the water of purification. But all that cannot endure fire you shall put through the water. But the seraph used a coal from the special holy fire of the altar, which God himself had lighted, and which was kept perpetually burning there, as we read in Leviticus 6.12, And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it, it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order on it, and he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. So the seraph made Isaiah holy as well as pure. There is more. In worship at the sanctuary, or temple, the main reason for taking a coal from the altar was to light incense. Compare Leviticus 16, 12 and 13, where the high priest is to take a censer full of coals from the altar and use it to light incense. But in Isaiah 6, the seraph applies the coal to Isaiah rather than to incense. Whereas Isaiah wanted to offer incense, Isaiah became like incense, just as holy fire lights incense to fill God's house with holy fragrance, it lights up the prophet to spread a holy message. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 
16, verses 12 and 13. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. It is no accident that in the very next verses of Isaiah 6, verses 8 and onwards, God sends Isaiah out to his people. Let's read some of that. Isaiah 6, beginning at verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then he said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return to be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. So to finish today, read prayerfully Isaiah's response in Isaiah 6 verse 5 to his vision of God. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. How do we see in it an expression of the basic problem, that of a sinful people existing in a universe created by a holy, holy, holy God, as it says in Isaiah 6.3? Why was Christ on the cross the only possible answer to this problem? What happened at the cross that solved this problem? Wednesday, January 6, Royal Commission. Our text for today is Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Having been purified, Isaiah immediately responded to God's call for a representative who he could send out on his behalf. In New Testament terms, Isaiah would have been called an apostle, that is, one who is sent. Interestingly enough, the book of Isaiah does not begin, as do some other prophetic books, with the prophet describing his prophetic call. For instance, Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And Ezekiel, um, there were whole three chapters, but just let's read the first three verses of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Cheba, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Cheba, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. And then he saw some amazing things. 
In other words, he must have already been called to be a prophet, even before the events of chapter 6. The Bible does not show that a divine encounter can encourage a prophet even after the ministry has begun, as with Moses in Exodus chapter 34. And you'll remember this. It starts in verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you, and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain." So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. And then there was Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. And I read from the first verse, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then, as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God." And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still, small voice. In contrast to other examples too, where God tells people they are to be prophets, in Isaiah 6, the prophet volunteers for a special mission. It appears that chapters 1 to 5 of Isaiah represent conditions at the time when Isaiah was first called, after which God jump-started his ministry by encouraging him at the temple and reconfirming his commission as God's prophetic spokesman. Question. God encouraged Isaiah at his temple. 
Is there evidence elsewhere in the Bible that God's sanctuary is a place of encouragement? And we're going to look at Psalm 73, particularly verse 17, and Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, and Hebrews 10, 19 to 23, and Revelation chapter 5. What do these texts tell us? Firstly, Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet have almost stumbled, my steps have nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace." Violence covers them like a garment, their eyes bulge with abundance, they have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore my people return here, the waters of a full cup are drained by them, and they say, How does God know? And is their knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. And Hebrews four fourteen to 16 Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Hebrews 10, 19-23 Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And Revelation chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though he had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the worth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Not only does God's sanctuary throb with awesome power, but also it's a place where weak and faulty people such as ourselves can find refuge. We can be assured by knowing that God is working to rescue us through Christ our High Priest. John also saw Christ represented as a sacrificial lamb that had just been slaughtered. Its throat slit, as we read in verse 6 of chapter 5. This is not a pretty sight. The description makes the point that although Christ was raised from the dead and has ascended to heaven, he continually carries the cross event with him. He is still lifted up in order to draw all people to himself at his altar. And so to finish the day, have you found encouragement by entering God's heavenly temple by faith in prayer? 
Hebrews 4.16 invites you to approach God's throne boldly to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If someone were to ask you how you have found grace and mercy in your time of need, how would you respond? Thursday, January 7. Appalling Appeal. Our text for today is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return to be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree, or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. Question. When God commissioned Isaiah, why did he give the prophet such a strange message to take to his people? Isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10 again. And he said, Go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and be healed. Lest we should think that Isaiah heard wrong, or that his message is unimportant, Jesus cited this passage to explain why he taught in parables, as we read in Matthew 13, verses 13 to 15. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn, so that I should heal them. God does not want any to perish which explains why he sent Isaiah to the people of Judah and Jesus to the world. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 reads, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's desire is not to destroy, but to save eternally. But while some people respond positively to his appeals, others become firmer in their resistance. Nevertheless, God keeps on appealing to them in order to give them more and more opportunities to repent. Yet, the more they resist, the harder they become. So, in that sense, what God does to them results in the hardening of their hearts, even though he would rather that these actions soften them. God's love toward us is unchanging. Our individual response to his love is the crucial variable. The role of the minister, such as Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or even Christ, is to keep on appealing, even if people reject the message. God said to Ezekiel in chapter 2 verse 5, Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. God's role and that of his servants is to give people a fair choice so that they will have adequate warning even if they end up choosing destruction and exile, Ezekiel 3, 
beginning at verse 16. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, You shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. And Isaiah chapter 6, verses 13 and 14, two of our verses for today. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. Question. With these ideas in mind, how do we understand God's role in hardening Pharaoh's heart? In Exodus 4.21, God says, But I will harden his heart. This is the first of nine times when God said he would harden Pharaoh's heart. But there were also nine times when Pharaoh hardened his own heart. For example, Exodus 8.15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them, as the Lord had said. And Exodus 8, verse 32, But Pharaoh hardened his heart at that time also, neither would he let the people go. And Exodus 9.34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. Clearly, Pharaoh possessed some kind of free will, or he would not have been able to harden his own heart. But the fact that God also hardened Pharaoh's heart indicates that God initiated the circumstances to which Pharaoh reacted when he made his choices. Choices to reject the signs God had given him. Had Pharaoh been open to these signs, his heart would have been softened, not hardened by them. And so to finish today, in your own experience with the Lord, have you ever felt a hardening of your heart to the Holy Spirit? Think through what caused it. If you didn't find that concept frightening then, after all, that's part of what having a hard heart is all about, how do you view it now? What is the way of escape? And I think we find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Friday, January 8. From the book Prophets and Kings, page 306 and 307, written by E.G. White, we read, Iniquitous practices had become so prevalent among all classes that the few who remained true to God were often tempted to lose heart and to give way to discouragement and despair. It seemed as if God's purposes for Israel were about to fail, and that the rebellious nation was to suffer a fate similar to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
In the face of such conditions, it is not surprising that when, during the last year of Isaiah's reign, Isaiah was called to bear to Judah God's messages of warning and reproof, he shrank from the responsibility. He well knew that he would encounter obstinate resistance. As he realised his own inability to meet the situation and thought of the stubbornness and unbelief of the people for whom he was to labour, his task seemed hopeless. Should he in despair relinquish his mission and leave Judah undisturbed to their idolatry? Were the gods of Nineveh to rule the earth in defiance of the God of heaven? End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, if a sceptic or an atheist were to challenge you with the question, how can you show that your God is in charge? What would you answer? Two, if God is in charge, why do innocent people suffer? Does Isaiah 1, 19 and 20 mean that in the present life only good things are supposed to happen to God's faithful people and only bad things happen to those who rebel? Isaiah 1, beginning at verse 19, If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken, and we're asked to compare that with Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. And chapter 1 begins with the verse, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And then Satan comes and attacks Job's character. And Job loses his property and children. And then in chapter 2, Satan attacks Job's health. And Job comes across three friends who explain to him that it's possibly his own fault. And then in Psalm 37, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for this place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just, and gnashes his, at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be for ever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendour of the meadows, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old, yet 
I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell evermore. For the Lord loves justice, and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved for ever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land, and dwell in it for ever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart, none of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor contemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power, and spreading himself like a native green tree, yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man, and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them, because they trust in him. And Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet have almost stumbled. My steps have nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them, and they say... How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors, as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, for God is the strength of my heart and my portion for ever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Can we reconcile our understanding of God's character with the bad that happens to people? Do we need to? And question 3. In Isaiah 6, why are there so many connections to the Day of Atonement? Consider the fact that on this yearly judgment day, God purified his people by cleansing sin from loyal ones, as we read in Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 30. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And purging out the disloyal, we read in Leviticus 23 verses 9, 29 and 30. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that day, that person I will destroy from among the people. And now for the summary of this week's lesson. 
At a time of insecurity, when the weakness of human leadership was painfully obvious, Isaiah was given a grand vision of the supreme leader of the universe. Petrified by inadequacy, but purified and empowered by mercy, Isaiah was ready to go forth as God's ambassador into a hostile world. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Hope in a Plane Crash, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. The world watched in horror when a mid air plane collision killed 71 people in Germany in 2002, and two years later, a grieving father retaliated. Vladimir Shevel, who was mourning the death of his own daughter to cancer, found hope amid the tragedy. He found Jesus. Vladimir remembers Nadezhda, whose name means hope in Russian, joyfully coming home with a new Bible that someone had given to her at school in their hometown of Moldova. The 15-year-old girl spent hours reading the book, often staying up late at night. Vladimir, an occasional churchgoer, didn't like his daughter's interest in the Bible. He accused her of wasting her time and said she would be more productive working in the family's vegetable garden. We don't need the Bible, he told her. We have a church. Nadezda didn't argue and obediently went outdoors to tend to the garden. Two years later, doctors diagnosed Nadezda with bone cancer. She spent months in the hospital and her leg was amputated from the hip. She died in 2001 at the age of 18. Vladimir was devastated and he pleaded with God for answers. I don't think that I was such a bad father, he prayed. Amid his sorrow, he heard the news in July 2002 that a DHL cargo plane had collided with a Russian airliner flying 45 Russian schoolchildren to a vacation in Spain killing everyone on both aircraft. Then, in 2004, a Russian father, who had lost his wife and two children in the crash, tracked down and killed the air traffic controller responsible for monitoring the German airspace where the collision occurred. Watching television news, Vladimir saw a journalist ask the father of a girl who had died in the crash whether he also wanted revenge. No, the man said. I have hope that I will meet my daughter again. The words touched Vladimir's heart. He longed for the same hope. Shortly afterward, he came home to find his wife waiting with Nadezda's Bible. Opening it, she read in 1 Thessalonians 4.13 and 14, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Here is our hope, his wife said. If we believe in God, we will meet our daughter again. Today, Vladimir is a church deacon and he joyfully talks about his hope in Jesus' return. Thanks to my daughter, we found God, he said. We have hope that we will meet our daughter again. Part of a 2017 13 Sabbath offering helped renovate a retreat centre for camp meetings, pathfinders and other church activities in Moldova. This lesson was read by Dr Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.